Okay, Paul here, and I'm on the bench today. I have a Zenit 7S261 that a customer brought in. Uh, I do a lot of work for this customer, and um, he gets nice radios, and this is no exception. It's a good radio, um, but in this case, it's one of those restorer's nightmares because we got to go through it and figure out exactly what is wrong. There's some good news and some bad news. The first bad news uh, would, wouldn't be bad news per se if it was done right, but the first bad news is it's been recapped. And I say it's bad news because the first place I always check is electrolytic capacitors, and these are wrong. So let me show you what I found um, here. Up here we have a candle resistor. It has positions, um, if we look at it up here from left to right, one, two, three, four. Well, on the schematic, it's not that way. On the schematic, it's four, three, two, one, um, as far as the way it's wired. When Zenith made this radio, uh, the schematic was made by the engineers, but the components were made by a manufacturer. And this particular pin here is connected to the metal case of the can dome. So this is ground because it's grounded to the chassis when they rivet it in. So to make it obvious, of course, and for wiring specifications, because they put a tie strip here that they needed to get to, they put it in the reverse order of the schematic diagram. Well, that makes it difficult, right? It makes it difficult to figure out how that how the wires go. I mean, you got to continually flip it in your mind because of the um, schematic being the reverse, right? The schematic was just drawn out by engineers. They, they, you know, they knew the components came this way, but they probably didn't realize that, you know, it would have to be mounted in the box this way or whatever, or Philco found out later. And the, I mean, the Zenith engineers found out later and just said, well, you know, be careful wiring it. So they, the assemblers knew that, and they wired hundreds of these, or, you know, however many of this particular model they made. And so, you know, they had a diagram or a written-out document that told the assemblers where to solder everything. Okay, well, in here we have, we had two capacitors. We had two in this can here, and we had one in this can here. They're on top of the chassis. Of course, they're bad, so they have to be replaced <coughs> with electrolytics. Well, the first thing that the guy, the restorer, did is he cut the tab off the can to use it as a tie point, um, and he so he wouldn't have to redo this resistor and these wires. He just soldered the capacitor across it and then cut the tab off, which has to be disconnected. However, I would have put this on a strip like this, right, bolted to the chassis somewhere, maybe up here in one of these holes that's already here, like that hole there or on the side here, like they did here, and mounted the capacitors on that. This is kind of flimsy. So that, when you open one up and you see something like this in your restorer, and this is supposed to be restored, you already, that's a red flag that, okay, I need to look at this. So the first thing I did is I checked um, this capacitor to see how he did this, these two. And I started with this one. He had this one soldered here, which is ground. It doesn't go to ground. It goes there. Um, which makes me wonder, are these capacitors right? You know, are they in the right place? Again, this, you know, because of this, right, you could get easily thrown off. However, on the schematic, it shows it as the second pin. So even if you got it mixed up, you'd have had it on this one, the second from that end, or the second from this end. But you wouldn't have had it on the first one, and especially one that goes to ground. That, that definitely 
is a problem. Now, where does it go? Well, it goes to this big old glob here of solder with a whole bunch of wires, and I don't know what's going on there. So I figured, well, I unsoldered that because I know it needs to move, and I'll show you that in a schematic in a second. And I was like, well, I got to check this capacitor because it's going to the other side of that, which is um, the 6F5 preamp tube or audio amp tube. And I'm like, with this big old glob of solder, that don't look good. He left pieces of wire standing there. So I started tracing these wires. And lo and behold, this, of course, it's pin 8. So it's the cathode of the tube. It comes down here to the cathode of this 6H6. Well, why? On a schematic, it doesn't go to the cathode of that tube. It's supposed to go to the output tube, which is over here, and go to the cathode of that, which is where this other capacitor is supposed to connect. So, anyway, I'm looking down here, and I find this. And it was just like this, actually. You see there? You see any problem? Look it. That wire's been cut. And it was just laying there in the chassis. It was laying up there. Probably he put this capacitor in. That somehow got kicked behind that other wire. And it was out of sight, out of mind. He never finished what he was doing with this glob. Um, or whoever worked on it or whatever happened. I don't know. But this should go to the cathode over there on the output tube. Which it's too short. So it might go to a cathode down here that does connect to the cathode up there. I don't know. I have to trace that out so from the get-go I found two problems about a cut wire going nowhere and a capacitor that is not on the right one and not a mix-up just way out of, the, of where it belongs the good thing is the capacitor was in in the, at least in the outright orientation you had the negative going to ground which is well I say that I mean, not, not all of the time is the chassis more negative than the circuit on the other side. The transformer um, comes in, and usually the center tap of the transformer is the most negative terminal. And it does go to the, a lot of times it does go to the chassis. But not in this case. Um, the chassis is raised a, a couple volts above ne the negative side. Okay, so there we got that. The second problem is this one here. Now this is another capacitor. The values are fine. Um, this is supposed to be a 12 and a 16, which he replaced with two 22s, which is today's standard. And I would have replaced them with 22s also. This was a two, he replaced it with a 4.7, that's fine. Um, it's hard to get a two, they don't make many of those and they're very expensive, so 4.7 makes sense. It's an Illinois capacitor, which is a, a really good capacitor. It is rated at 450 volts, so he's got the voltage rating right. But this one here, he's got going to pin, what is that, let me get a light in there. He's got it going to pin one, two, three, four. It looks like pin four with this capacitor going parallel, almost in parallel with it connecting to this wire. So pin four. Pin four is the shield of the output tube. I don't believe that that's correct. I don't think it goes to the shield. It's supposed to go to the cathode, I would believe. These here, I don't even know if that solder joint's right, and I don't know what he was doing here. This, I don't know what this came from. I know Zenith didn't put these two resistors together and leave it dangling like that. So, and you can see it was cut from something. So I gotta figure that out. Um, and it may be fine, it may be correct, but just sloppy. Should have been uh, redone, you know. Uh, that, that definitely needs to be cleaned up. Um, okay. So what do these two capacitors do? Well, they're smoothing capacitors. These take the AC that comes out of the transformer and to converts it to DC for the rest of the uh, system. The tubes run on DC. The whole radio runs on DC, with the exception of the audio signal, which is a uh, very small voltage AC signal, and the filaments 
of the tubes, their AC. Other than that, the radio is DC. So these, the job of these is to convert DC, smooth it. Let me show you on the schematic how that works. Okay, here you have your AC line coming in to the tran. This is the transformer. It has three outputs, one input. So 120 volts goes through this circuit here when the switch is on. Okay, it's just a loop. AC just keeps going through. Your line voltage just goes through. Coming out of this side, we have the filament voltage that's 5 volts to drive this rectifier tube. The rectifier tube is what converts AC to DC. Okay, and the way it does it is it has another loop here, which is the plate circuit. And the, cat, the filament heats up, emits electrons. These plates are positively charged, and they draw those electrons. And so they go through this circuit. So this is positive, and this is positive. Now, how they, that's full wave, basically, it's called full wave rectification. But this is positive, and this is positive DC. So how do you get a negative DC in the radio? Well, it's simple. You put a center tap here, and you take that, and you run that somehow to ground. Eventually, it goes to ground, or it goes to the negative side of the circuit. And so, since that's in the center, this is positive, but this is negative. It's more negative than this. So you have like a battery from here to here, positive, negative, and then you got like, on this one's positive too. So you got like a battery in backwards, negative, positive. So it's like two batteries with the negatives connected together, or two batteries in parallel. So this is positive, this is positive, this is negative. <clears throat> These are positive in relationship to this filament voltage here, okay? Because the electrons, I mean, these are negative in response to this because the electrons are leaving here and going to these positive plates, which is making this more positive as the electrons leave. And this, even though it's positive, more negative than this. But this is the most negative point of the circuit normally. Now on this radio it's a little bit different. Okay, but when the DC comes out of this, and this is a lot of information, I understand that, when the DC comes out of this, it has AC ripple on it. It's not pure DC. Instead of being a nice straight line of DC voltage, you know, like this being time, so say you have 250 volts DC over time, it's always 250 volts through time. Well, this, when it comes out of here, it has a ripple. So it's 250 volts, but it does this over time. And that's called the ripple. So you got to get rid of it. That's the job of these capacitors. Now, here's how they work. You have a capacitor here. It builds up a charge when this one goes up. And then when this comes down... It discharges and feeds that signal some power back to pull it back up. When it goes up, this capacitor charges and sucks power out of it and pulls it back down. So the net effect is, instead of it being like this, a ripple on the DC, it's more like this, a little ripple on the DC. Well, they, got, they want to get rid of that too. So they run it through the coil. The coil is just the opposite of a capacitor. So it fights against the, what the capacitor is doing and actually helps to make the ripple even smaller. But there's still a little bit of ripple in there. So when it comes out of the coil, they put another capacitor. And that second capacitor, after it comes out of that, is pretty much straight DC, right? So that's the purpose of this circuit here. This resistor with these four points on it, that's the metal resistor we were looking at at the top. The capacitor that was in the wrong place is this capacitor here. Now you notice if you follow the wire up from it and come over where it comes down and connects, connects on the second one from the ground side. This is the ground side, you know, the metal pin we showed you that goes to ground. Well, they had this capacitor connected over here to ground 
instead of over here, which is 125 ohms from ground. So it's up higher than ground. So they had that in the wrong place. And like I said, if they had it here, I would understand because it's confusing because this one has the ground on the right, but the radio actually has the ground on the left. It's just a mirror image of this, right? But it's still going to be wired this way. So it still has to go to this second from the ground, which would be this one on the radio, the way this, this is switched over. But they didn't have it here, and they didn't have it here. They had it on the end. It doesn't go on the end. That's pretty obvious, right? It does not go on the end. It goes on the second from the end. No matter what side you come from, it's still not the end. So that's a red flag that, okay, they didn't even follow the schematic. So the next thing is, when is this coil? Well, you notice it says it's the speaker field. It's actually on the, the speaker. It's not the speaker coil. That's up here. This is the speaker coil here. There's this, the speaker coil. This is the output transformer that's in the radio. Or probably tied to the speaker. Some, it's probably tied on the speaker. But this is a different transformer. So we don't need to worry about that. And this is the speaker coil. This here is not a speaker coil. This is a speaker field coil. And all that means is it's a field coil to get rid of AC. Okay, to help get rid of that that, that ripple on the, on the DC line. It's just a field coil. It could be anywhere. It could be mounted on the top of the radio. It could be mounted under the radio. Of course, I'm just saying a coil could be anywhere. It just happens that it's called the speaker coil. And the reason it's called the field coil for the speaker is because it develops a magnetic field that the speaker needs. Okay, so they use it for two jobs. One, to smooth AC. By the way, this is called, these three is called a Pi filter. Because it looks, if you flip it upside down and put the coil on the top and the capacitors on the bottom, it looks like the Greek letter Pi. So they call it a Pi filter. It doesn't matter which way it's oriented, it's still called the pie filter. All right, but anyway, this is part of this smoothing section, but it does a job for the speaker, and, it, and it's rated at 1,250 ohms. But what it does for the speaker is the speaker here has a coil that goes in and out as the, as the music's going through the speaker, right, or voice, the magnetic field on this coil changes direction with the music or with the voice. And there's a magnet here. And so when this goes one way, the north pole of this magnet, this becomes south pole. They attract, it pulls the speaker in. When this goes the other way, it becomes a north. You got a north and a north. They repel, it pushes the speaker out. And that's how the speaker works. That's what makes the speaker go in and out with the music of the voice. Problem is, when this radio was made, they didn't have permanent magnets. So what they put was a steel, what would be a magnet, but it wasn't magnetized. It was just a piece of iron, shaped just like magnets today. Okay, just a piece of iron. They would wrap this coil that they used to to get rid of AC on the D on, and create DC, they would wrap that coil around that piece of iron. And so it would make it a magnet. The current going through here is always in the same direction because it's coming off the rectifier tube. It's already DC, it's just fluctuating. So it's always in the same direction. So it always has the same North Pole, the same South Pole on the speaker all of the time. They don't change. It's always north, always south, because that's what that field coil does. So in effect, it takes this piece of steel and turns it into the equivalent of what we have today called permanent magnets. And then this coil does its thing, flipping back and forth and pushing the speaker in and out and making the sound that we hear, the radio station, whatever it is we're listening to. That's the job of this field coil. And it's rated at 120 ohms. If you put an ohm meter from here to here and read the resistance going through that coil, you should get 100, uh, 1,250 ohms. Now, okay, 
So from here to there is 1,250 ohms. That, oh, and that is where these two capacitors connect. Now remember I said they had one in the right place and they had one in the wrong place. This one they had in the right place. And it's putting power to one side of the speaker coil. Okay. Then this one connects over here and does a different job. It supports tubes back here. We won't worry about that one. These are the two big ones. So this one puts power on this side of the coil and filters. This one puts power on the other side of the coil. So these two big ones go across the coil, okay? You notice the other end of that comes up and it goes over here. And this is the cathode of the output tube. And if you follow that line down and come across, you see it goes up to the cathode of that tube. It also goes up and comes this way and goes to the cathode of this tube. That's the tube with the broken wire, right? has a wire coming off of it that's just broken. It, by the way, is supposed to go to that one um, capacitor that's uh, disconnected. You know, they're on the same line, right? This is supposed to connect here. It's not connecting here. It's not connecting to the cathode. This is supposed to go to the cathode, and it's not going to the cathode. But it's not connected uh, it is, well, it will be connected to the cathodes when I put it back where it belongs, over here. But in the schematic diagram, it's connected to the cathodes, right? On this side, it's connected to the wrong place. They got this one connecting here. Um, no, I'm sorry, they got this one connecting there, and that's correct. This one's in right. See, it comes down, goes to the coil, it also comes down, and it comes to that resistor. That's this resistor here, this brown and black one, and see, it does go to it. Okay, so they got that right, and they, they don't have this side of this one right. They have it, they don't have either side right. I don't even know where that one's connecting. They had it connected here. It doesn't go there, so I disconnected this side of it. I don't even know where they got this side connected. I haven't gotten that far. So back up. This big capacitor smooth is to smooth out the ripple. It connects to that coil. This one connects. is supposed to connect here. It's not connecting here, um, which caused the problem because now this coil has a short circuit to ground here through this capacitor rather than um, getting some DC from this capacitor. The voltage wasn't right there. It wasn't pulling these cathodes down like it's supposed to to ground which means this voltage was elevated somehow or some way, and that's a big problem. So, if I take my meter and I go across, and I'll put this on sound so you can hear it, or you'll be able to see it. If I go across these two pins here, Go into the speaker. This this cable goes to the speaker. Speaker's in there. I get 382.7 ohms. Okay. That's across here. That's the speaker coil. All right. Now the other two are the field coil. This one and this one. And it's hard to do this with one hand, but uh, let me get it in there. All right, those two. Look at open load. Now, what that says right now is that the field coil is burnt up. Most likely because the capacitor is in the wrong place. And I can show that that field coil is not connected to anything because if I go to the speaker side, nothing there. If I go to the speaker side, nothing there. So you know I got the right two pins. These two are for the speaker, they're working. These two are for the field coil. These two are for the speaker, they're working. These two here that are close together are for the field coil. There's, they're not working. That's this 1250 ohms. We don't have it. So I move the speaker over here. And what I'm going to do is take it apart. And we're going to hope 
and cross our fingers that see there's some damage here we're gonna hope and cross our fingers that somehow they yanked this wire broke the cabinet and the wire came loose because if that isn't the case they shorted the field coil out with their bad capacitor job up there and the speaker is no good speaker is no good without the field coil it has no permanent magnet it has no magnet at all without the field coil so it's absolutely no good even if the speaker is immaculate looking if the field coil is bad the speaker is no good replacing a field coil is uh, way beyond the scope of what most restorers will do the coil would have to be rewound it's a big job it takes specialized equipment um, normally you would have to send it out and have it done if you can find somebody that would even do it for you so right now i'm going to take the speaker out this speaker was already loose and this was not sitting down on it the way it is now like it's supposed to the way it goes in the case uh, so I have already taken this off and readjusted it so that this this housing would go down where it belongs. But that was long before I started um, troubleshooting, or I would have checked it then. So I'm going to pause the video, take this off, and we'll take a look at the speaker. Okay, here's the speaker out of the case. This is the output transformer. A lot of radios put this under the chassis. Some put it on top of the chassis. You see it just bolts on there, right? That's the output transformer. And there's some damage to it here, but it seems okay. It looks like it's just the outer paper been damaged. Um, okay, so the music or the voice or the radio station comes in here and it goes through this transformer comes out here and it goes to the speaker coil which moves this which is the speaker coil okay that's the output transformer the other two wires here go into here this is the field coil this coil here this is what makes this shaft that goes down through here a magnet because it's not a permanent magnet. This is the speaker coil. This is the wires that I was hoping were broken. And I'm not seeing any broken wire. These are little single copper wire. One single copper wire. And they got insulation over them. But So the insulation looks like big wire here and here. But they're just little copper wires. Same in there. They're little copper wires. Actually all coils are. They've got... I don't know if I can test that. They got two wires here, which I'm assuming would be the speaker wires. Yeah, I think that's the speaker wire coming across there. Take that off. Okay, that one's going down there and coming over to here. Okay, so that's the speaker wire. They've also got two coils here uh, this one here on the top these two that little thing there that's a little coil um it's they consider it part of the field coil it's actually not it's it's a bucking humbucking coil and it's in series with the output transformer to get rid of some of the noise that comes in through the output transformer and that's not the problem that's a different coil than this one. This coil here is the field coil that we're having problems with. This is just a bucking coil. So if I check across these, I should have something. You might even hear some sound out of the speaker. See? It's fine. Can't hold it. It's about an ohm. Yeah. Not even an ohm. 0.6 ohms. Okay. And from here, say, it's part of the speaker, speaker coil. Unfortunately, this field coil seems bad. 
The only other possibility is that this wire is broken somewhere between here and here, where it goes into the transformer. So what I'm going to have to do, if it was broken, it would probably be broken right here, where it goes in here, where it's pinched. So what I'm going to have to do is strip this a little bit here, at least one of them, and see if I can get a signal. If I strip it here, this, see you got a yellow wire and a, like a bluish wire. If I strip it here and come from here, which, you know, the wires are discolored, but there they are. There's the yellow wire, there's the bluish wire. If I come to here to where I stripped it, I'd be testing this yellow wire. If it's bad, then we know, okay, there's a break in the wire. If it's good, then if I test from here, um, I'm still not going to get a signal because we, we would, this side would go through the coil, come back, go in through the coil, go around, come back to where I stripped it. But we already know we're not getting a signal all the way through. So what I would have to do is strip them both and check one at a time to check the wires. I'd also be checking the plug by doing that because I would touch it to here. So if I strip the yellow and I touch the yellow here and I still don't have a signal, either the wire is broken or the connection in here is broken. But at least that eliminates which one it is. If I touch the blue and the blue's fine up here, and I touch the yellow and the yellow's not fine, then I know it's either in this connector or in the yellow wire. Vice versa, if the yellow tests good and the blue tests bad from there to here, then it's either the blue wire or in the connector on the blue side. So that's what I gotta check. If I check a strip both and check across here and get nothing, then the field coil's bad. Okay. So keep your fingers crossed, <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and strip this, and we'll do a test. Okay, I've got the um, speaker set up. I stripped these two wires here, and we're now going to test it. So if I put this on, let's start with the yellow wire. If I put this on the yellow wire, and we check the yellow wire here, We get 0.3 ohms. Let me put it on sound. Okay, so you hear it. So so the wire is good from here to here. We just checked, not just the wire, but we checked that connection, and the connection is fine. So now if I go to the black wire or the bluish color wire, it's actually black, I guess. I don't know. It's kind of a bluish. The other one's black. Okay, so if I check the uh, bluish wire here, it's good. That tells us two things. It tells us that this wire, this connection is good. Also tells us that the field coil is bad because the wires are fine. And if I go across them here, nothing. So the coil itself is bad. So anyway, I need to find a speaker. Bad news for the owner. And I'll check the other coils. But anyway, thanks for watching.